All right. Would you please turn with your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning. Um, how many of you guys have, have studied Revelation? How many of you guys have studied it? Okay. How many of you guys enjoy the book of Revelation? Yeah? I love the book of Revelation. I think it's one of my top favorites. If it's not my favorite, I would say James and Revelation are really battling for the top prize in my heart, you know, because I really enjoy both of them uh, for different reasons. The reason I like Revelation as much is because I guess the mysteries that still haven't been unlocked yet. You know, we can read through the rest of the Bible for the most part, all the stories about, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We can read all these different stories and they've already taken place. So it's kind of one of those things you're like, okay, I can get involved with this. But when I talk about Revelation, these are things that have yet to come. So there's a little there's excitement, anticipation. So some things are building up inside of me. And I, I love going through Revelation because the more we study it, the more things are becoming unlocked to us as we go forward. Uh, it's pretty neat to see the things that Jesus talked about here on earth uh, beginning to unfold right before our eyes. You know, there's no reason to fear or panic because we see the end of time coming. We should be rejoicing, picking, picking him up our head and rejoicing, saying, you know what? I can't wait for my Redeemer to split that eastern sky so we can all go home. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So here in the, the first two chapters, chapters two and chapter three, rather, of revelation we find words of praise encouragement and rebuke to seven real life churches the reason why it's important for us to remember that these are real life churches is so we can relate to them because it's real easy to get into a book or a story of fictitious characters and events and everything else and we can separate ourselves from them because we realize it's not reality but here in the second and third chapter of Revelation, it's talking about these, these churches that are real. They're alive. These things are really at work taking place in Jesus' time. And what, and what was also coming about with this is he's talking about the church today. The seven churches that are mentioned in Revelations 2 and 3, we can see evidences of the same things going on in the church today. Amen? So as we go through this, this, this study this morning and any time that you're in the Bible, I think it's important for all of us to have that question on our mind, what am I supposed to learn from this? If we go into every single Bible study with that mindset, what am I supposed to gain from this? It will completely transform the, 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 the energy that we put in front of it or into the Word of God. Because God wants us to gain information. Nothing in the Bible, not one verse, not one passage, not one syllable was written in there just to take up space. The Holy Spirit gave inspiration to these men to write these verses down, write these passages down, to inspire and change hearts of mankind forever. So no matter if you're reading one verse, one chapter, one book, or the entire thing, ask the Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to learn from this today? Make it personal, make it right now, and allow the Holy Spirit to move upon you. Amen? Every single bit of it has some kind of significance. So right now we're going to begin with verse 1 through 7 in Revelation chapter 2 here. So read along with me. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, and, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Verse 3. You have persevered and have, found, and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent... I will come to you and remove your lampstand stand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Every, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this timely message. I thank you for the words that you put upon my heart. 
Father, I ask you to use me as your willing vessel to bring forth the message of hope, love, and restoration. Father, today I just ask you to anoint the ears of the ones listening in this room and around the world. Father, let them hear your voice spoken, Father, today. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. So as John wrote down the words of Jesus here, we can find words of encouragement and rebuke. Now, many of the sermons that I've heard about, you know, the seven churches, most of them concentrate on the failures of the seven churches. But the things they did, they came up short with. And I don't know how many of you guys were following along closely. Anybody take a head count on how many good things Jesus commended them on? You know, I counted several in here. I'm going to go down here real quick because he gave them several pats on the back, several attaboys before he made the rebuke. But then he followed it up with another attaboy at the very end. So let's go through that real fast. So it starts out with, I know your deeds, right? You work hard. He's telling the church, you work hard. You keep your nose down. You keep going day after day after day. You persevered. It means they overcame things that were obstacles. They didn't quit even though the going was getting tough. They kept going forward. They also in, they were intolerant of wickedness. That's an important key fig, a point right there. They did not accept the, the, the teachings of false prophets and false gods. They were intolerant of wickedness. They also tested the apostles to find them false or to be true. That's something that all of us can, can recognize and remember that it's important for all of us to do that every single day. The Bible tells us to test all spirits. Amen? Amen. Don't just take them on face value because the enemy will come in as like an angel of light and deceive many. You go through you know, Matthew 24, how many different parts of the Bible or in that, in that chapter says watch out for false prophets, watch out for false teachers, keep your guard up. We, as a congregation, we as children of God, should be testing all spirits at all time. You know, in, in verse 3, he mentions perseverance again, which makes me believe that, man, this is important to Jesus because they kept going, they kept going, they kept going. Even when they were bombarded with negativity and evil, they kept going strong. Enduring hardships for the name of Christ. They also did not grow weary. They kept going. They came back to God every single day saying, I need more power. I need more might. I need more anointing. I need more energy. How many of you guys need more energy? Amen. Even myself. I need more energy every day because I want to do more for the kingdom of God. There's times where I don't feel so good. I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to just, I want to roll back over and stay there for a little while. But God breathes new life into me every single day. The same he wants to do for you. So we can keep going forward. And then he followed up the very end and says, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans. And so did he. It's real easy for us to pinpoint the negative things that we see going on in the Ephesians church. Because many pastors want to draw this out of them. And we're going to get to it. We're going to discuss all of them today. Including the bad stuff with the good stuff. But it's so easy for us to concentrate our energy or our attention directly at the negative things that we see going on in people's lives. They have one fault, they have one failure, and that's what your attention focuses on. They are this way. And you completely ignore the other nine things they're doing for the kingdom of God. You focus your attention on that only. It's time for that to change. That's not the way God sees us, right? And the, the, the sad part of the whole thing is, we don't just do that to other people. We do it to ourselves as well. We only see the negative things inside of us we don't like. When you get, get up in the morning, you stare at that person in the mirror, and you're like, I don't like you because of this one little fault. And you completely ignore the blessings and the promises and the gifts and talents that God did put upon your life. All you see is the negative stuff. We need to start naming the positive things, not just in our lives, but the ones around us. Being thankful for your brothers and sisters. They may be different. They may wear their hair a different style than yours. It's okay. They may have a different worldview than you, but you can find some love in your heart for that individual. 
before we get too far in this, I want to give you a little backstory of the Ephesians. You know, or Ephesus, rather. So Ephesus was a very important city. It was a very large city, and it was a kind of a, a trade hub, if you, if you think of it that way. They had land and sea trade coming through this thing all the time. It was a very, very prominent city, a very diverse city as well. So along with the trade industry brought a lot of different people. And not the same religion, not the same background, not the same last name of people, but a lot of variable different kind of people came together in Ephesus and called that place home. With that came in a whole lot of more problems. You know, you think about America being a melting pot. We have walks of life from all different nationalities and countries and beliefs all coming to America to find this place as home. That's kind of what Ephesus was. You know, I think this is why Jesus focused so much attention in this church of Ephesus, because he knew the impact that Ephesus was going to have on the entire world. Because if people are coming in here doing trade, and then receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they go back home, you just have ministries branching off left and right and up and down. So they had a wide variety of different beliefs, uh, even gods, little g's. Okay, they had a lot of things going on inside the, 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 the city that was not right, right? And they had to deal with a lot. The, the church of Ephesus had to deal with a lot of nonsense. They had to sort through a lot of things. You have to remember, this is a first century church. It wasn't a church 20 years ago. This, was the, this is the ground floor of their faith, so now they're trying to take the, the words of Jesus, take the words of Paul and the apostles and all the other ones and build their faith, ignoring the noise and the confusion going on around them. <coughs> there was a high likelihood that there was a lot of false teachers trying to slip through the cracks and infiltrate the body. You can kind of see evidence of that in, in verse 2 here. It says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. It means they had problems going on within the body of believers. So this is where I'm saying we have to recognize this is a real church with real problems, with real people. Anybody ever dealt with a real person that did not have a problem, let me know because somewhere along the line you were lied to. None of us can walk on the high, high road their entire life, there's some problems lurking somewhere. You know, in this battle between the forces of darkness and, and the forces of, of truth, it's a daunting task. It is a painstaking task. It can wear you down over time. When you have, you know, the, the darkness trying to push against the light in a constant battle, and you're in the midst of going, what's true, what's false, where should I stand? It wears the body down and overrun you if you allow it to if you allow it to it will overrun you today's message i have entitled jaded i have chosen this title simply because i feel that's exactly what was going on in the church of ephesus they endured hardship after hardship battle after battle fight after fight they endured it, and over time, they become jaded, worn down, and tired. I believe this was such a, I guess the reason why Jesus thought this was such a big thing to talk about, why he rebuked them of this, because he realized that if they were jaded, if their love for others grew cold, they would not have the impact that he desired for the rest of the world through this church. Let's just say hypothetically, okay, this is hypothetically. Let's say the church continued to go through the motions of their faith. They checked all the right boxes, you know. Feed the hungry, check. Clothe the naked, check. Pray, check. Read their word, all right, fine, check. But their love... For others were cold. Would they still inherit the kingdom of God? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not their judge. I can tell you this. I don't want to find myself standing there in judgment day with a cold heart. 
Because what I know with it, what I found within the scriptures that we can do a whole lot more for the kingdom of God if we allow the love of God to move through us. We can't allow our love to go cold for the world around us. God intends to reach the world through us. He can send messengers, he can send dreams, he can send all these different things out there. But he created us to be the hands and feet of Christ. He created us to go out there to the highways and byways. He created us to love the unlovable. He created us to forgive the unforgivables. He created us to be the church of Jesus Christ. But there's a warning or a... We'll say foretelling in Matthew 24, verse 12, of the things that are going to take place as the end nears. It says, because, the, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because of the increase of wickedness. Jesus is telling us there will be an increase of wickedness as his time arises. The closer we get to Jesus' return, wickedness is going to increase. I think we're beginning to see that come out. We're not supposed to be alarmed of it. I mean, none of us are going to stand up and go, yay, wickedness. We're not doing that. But we should not be alarmed by what we're seeing playing out in the streets, the nations, and the governments around the world. It's just a fulfillment of a 2,000-year-old prophecy. The word in that, in that passage there, if it's still up there, that breaks my heart the, is the word most. The love of most will grow cold. That breaks my heart to think that most, even if it's only 51%, will grow cold in the last days. I do not want to be in that category. I have no problem being in the minority of believers that will not lose my faith, will not lose my hope, will not lose my love for God for, or mankind. It is God's desire to see all saved. That's what his desire is. He, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for all sins, all mankind. There's no select few here and there that he's picked. Jesus died for all of creation. And it's up to us, the remnant church, the ones that are holding on to Jesus Christ to tell the world about it and show the love. You know, some of this jadedness comes from where we put our trust because I'm not going to pretend that some of us in this room right now are not feeling a little jaded, a little put off by the things that we've been seeing play out in the last month or even a year. But a lot of this jadedness comes from where we put our trust, where we put our attention, where we put our hope is why we become jaded. We've taken our attention away from the, G from the Jesus Christ of this Bible who conquers all things and we put it upon things that, that will only, they're only temporary our economic status, our, you know, the, the, the dollar. I've shared this with you a hundred times probably. After, you know, the recession, I quit putting my trust in, in finances. I went to job one morning. I did not have another, didn't have the same job that same night. Then I was in the middle of a house, building a house. And my boss says, I got to lay you off. We have no more money. Everything stops. This last year, a lot of things were turned on its head. Just for, not just for the United States, but worldwide. And if you put your faith into government, wow, you need some therapy. They're going to let you down. Because they're men and women. They're not true. They're not holy. They're not all-knowing. They're human beings. And when we begin to put our faith and trust in things that are temporary and they fail us, something inside of us break. And we become jaded. And when our heart breaks, it doesn't just break cleanly, it gives off shards. 
It's sharp little edges. When people try to come in, they get cut. They get injured. They get wounded because of the sharpness going on inside of our hearts. We cannot take what we see on Facebook or news media or anything else and allow it to change who we are as believers. You know, every single day, it's real easy to get bombarded with negativity. You flip on the news for 20 minutes, and I guarantee you have about 10 different negative things about going on in the world. Turn it off. Turn it off. I don't know the last time I watched the news. And this is going to blow your mind, but the world kept spinning, even though I didn't know about it. I know some of you think that I'm whacked out. That's probably not the reason you think that, but that's okay. The world keeps going around, even if you don't know about every single nasty detail going on. It doesn't, I'm not saying bury your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't happen. What I'm saying to you is get your knees on the carpet and your face on the floor and begin to cry out to God to change this nation. Last week, what did I tell you? The prayers are powerful and effective from you sitting here watching the tv and allowing it to infiltrate your life is destroying your joy your love and your peace turn it off maybe you need to turn off facebook except for to like and share this video but other than that turn it off because you know what there's a lot of garbage out there trying to get your attention and if you think about it, horses wear these blinders when they're trying to stay on course. For what reason? So the noise, confusion, the other animals, the other junk doesn't take their attention away from the direction they're going. Put on your Holy Spirit blinders and move forward, church. Because it's changing who you are inside. It's making your love grow cold because of the environment around you. These TVs, I mean... <laughs> They're changing who we are. And it's just garbage that they're bringing in. Garbage. I mean, I don't think any of us in this room would open up the back door of our house and let every stray, single stray dog to come in to make a mess in our living room floor and think it was okay. But we invite these news outlets to bring them into that filth into our living rooms and we sit there and stare at it for hours. No. It's time to turn it off. And get our nose buried in the word of God. That's where our hope, that's where our freedom, that's where our trust needs to remain. Amen? I really like what Philippians 4, 6 says. It says, freak out about everything you hear and frantically run to God with whining and pity. Oh, I'm sorry, that was the American English church version. Because that's what we do. We hear something and we're like, oh no, what is God going to do? We're going to run out of time. He's not going to have time to change things. What about this? And God's sitting in the throne going, it ain't over, dude. Chill out. When I came into the sanctuary on Tuesday or Wednesday early morning, I mean, this is 5 a.m. And I'm like, God, he goes, it ain't over. I'm like, good point. Good point completely changed my prayer time with god because of the one word it ain't over just because you see things going on in the natural realm that you think is over who cares god's still in control all these things are our fear tactics of the enemy because if we truly read the word of god philippians 4 6 it says do not be anxious about anything Think of something right now that you're worried about and insert it into this verse. Because it falls under that category of anything. Do not be worried. Do not be anxious. Do not fret about anything. Don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about your income. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your kids. Pray about everything. Nothing has ever been changed because of fear or anxiety. Nothing has changed except your heart. That's the only thing that it will impact, your heart. Because the remainder of this verse, it says, but in every situation, 
It's cool he includes everything in this, in this verse. But in every situation, including the one you're going through today, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, knowing that he's on the, he's on the throne. Present it to him. We have no reason to fear about anything. Is there going to be violence in the streets? I hope not. But if they are, God's in control. Amen. Who's in the presidency? God's in control. God's going to show us the direction. And maybe he's shaking the church, allowing us to see some of this darkness to show us who he truly is. The powerful, the great I am. So stop working yourself into a tizzy and allowing access of Satan into your mind. Just stop it. Make that choice. I'm not going to allow Satan to come into this any longer. I choose to turn off the TV Turn off the phones and be with Jesus. We have zero reasons to fret. I can't think of one thing that we have to worry about. I really don't. Am I happy with what everything is going on? No. Am I worried about it? No. Because this word tells me that he has a final say. You know, I think back and, uh, of the story of David and Goliath. Awesome story. I really enjoy that. There's so many deep biblical truths in that story. It's not just a kid's story. And I encourage you to go back and read it whenever you have time. But the way my mind works, and maybe yours does too, I imagine David walking up to the battlefield, maybe hands in his pocket, just kind of swaggering through there, you know, reaches in there, pulls out a rock, and Pulls out a sling in his other hand, and he sits there. And he sits back a little bit with a smirk on his face. Because even though he's staring down the biggest man he's ever seen, he knows who he is through Christ. This one little stone in the hand of God was going to bring that giant down. He wasn't worried about anything. He wasn't worried, what if this thing, what if I miss? What if God doesn't come through? What if? He sat back and says, I know who I am through Christ. I know who God sent me out to be, to be the conqueror over this giant. And with a smirk on his face, he launched that stone of faith and brought that giant down to the ground. Church, know who you are. Don't let the enemy steal your identity ever, ever again. Some of you guys might need to be reminded that time and time again. Who you are in Christ changes everything. Your identity will change your outlook. Hmm. Let's go back to uh, Revelation 2, uh, verse 7 real fast. I want to pull out a nugget that's right smack dab in the middle of this verse here. Is it up there? Perfect. To the one who is victorious. How many of you guys like to live in victory? Yes! How many of you guys like being conquerors? Yes! Ready? You can't have victory unless you have a battle. That one stings a little. You can't have a victory without facing something bigger than yourself. You cannot be an overcomer unless you overcame something. Which means there's an obstacle in your path that God has helped you overcome. We can't have a testimony without having that test. And everybody's like, yay, testing. But it proves who you are in Christ. All these trials, all these testing, all these different things that God puts you through is not to destroy you. I want you to grab a hold of that this morning. It's not to destroy you. If you think about uh, a, a, uh, a blacksmith making a sword, he takes a hunk of metal, a worthless piece of metal, and sticks it into a fire. Not just a low heat, but a blazing forge, getting it glowing red hot. And then when he takes it out of the fire, he begins to beat on it over and over and over again. And then he goes back into the fire. 
pulling it back out and then beating on it some more. It's not really a pretty process. But some of us feel like we're in the forge and some of us feel like we're getting beat on. But here's the glorious thing at the very end. That worthless chunk of metal becomes a weapon in the hand of our Lord. He's tempering you. He's preparing you. He's not destroying you, even though it might feel a little uncomfortable. He's preparing you to reach more people. And maybe you feel like you're in the fire a little longer than the ones to your left and right. Maybe you're beat on a little harder than the ones around you. Perhaps it's because he has a greater purpose for your life. Maybe that's why you're going through this fiery time a little longer than you expected. It's not to destroy you, but to build you up, to make you stronger, to make you more powerful, to make you more of an effective weapon in the hand of the Lord. Do not let it overcome you, church. Let's look again at Revelation 2, verse 6. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice how Jesus said this. You hate the practices of these people. Not you hate the people. You don't hate the Nicolaitans. You hate the practices of the people. We must not fall into this trap of Satan of hating people. Because of what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're thinking, what they believe. We cannot hate people. There's a huge difference in the two. You see, the Nicolaitans, they compromised their faith. They allowed false teaching to infiltrate their hearts and they begin to go astray. We would kind of relate that to a backslidden person in today's time and understanding. They gave up. Some of the promises and the laws that God gave them to indulge into sinful lifestyles. But here Jesus says you hate their works, you hate what they're doing, but you do not hate them. Big difference. Big difference. Sinful people are not our enemy. Understand that for a moment. Sinful people are not our enemy. The people who make up the Republican Party or the Democratic Party are not our enemy. The people who make up BLM, uh, Antifa, KKK, they're not our enemy. As crazy as that sounds, the people are not our enemy. Our enemy is the darkness that's inside of them. That's where we should focus our attention. We should love them. Oh, I know. It's the craziest thing you've heard to love these type of people. God's telling us to do so he's telling us he's instructing us to love them regardless of what they're saying doing thinking love people not tolerate their wickedness i pray that every single crooked politician goes to jail every single looter violent person whatever they they pay the price but their soul is what i'm after You see, I'm, uh, I understand what it's like to love someone that's unlovable. To forgive someone that's kind of unforgivable. I stare at him every morning in the mirror. Maybe some of you guys feel the same way. That you've done some things that you don't really deserve forgiveness from the Father. And yet he did so. He freely gave you love. He gave you forgiveness. He gave you grace and mercy. Even though you didn't deserve it. So when we look down our noses at the other people, they are lost souls who need Jesus. Every single last one of them. I'm still praying for revival to come out of the White House. And I don't care who's the president. I don't care who's in Congress. I'm praying they open up and they close with an amen. Period. Why not? The powers that we possess through prayer are effective.
one verse in this thing that's really been gnawing at me. It says, if you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. Church, I'm coming in agreement with Jesus Christ here, and I'm calling out for an all-out repentance of the saints. Every single dark, twisted thought that you've had, every bitterness that you have allowed to take residency inside your heart, I'm calling that you repent of it immediately. Turn your heart over to Christ 100%. Because if you do not do so, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. We've already forfeited our joy when we allow this darkness to come in. Do not forfeit your salvation as well. As I studied out uh, Matthew 24 this last week even more, and other passages like that concerning the end times, there's not much time left before Jesus comes back. I mean, the things that we see unfolding in just Matthew 24, it makes your jaw open going, wow, this is taking place now. And I don't think I'm trying to twist world events and make it fit into the Bible. I think it's going perfectly like a puzzle piece with no forcing needed. This time of repentance is not just a one and done either. Repentance is a lifelong way of living per per se that as soon as that thought comes in your mind of anger bitterness lord i'm sorry and i pray for that person pray for that person pray for pelosi pray for president trump pray for the ones that we have elected in positions believing that god has everything under control we may not like what they're doing pray for them allow the holy spirit to change who they truly are The main purpose of us to be in a time of repentance is because when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a spotless and pure bride. I don't know if bitterness and anger is defined as spotless or pure. I'm not seeing that. It's time for us to wash our wedding garments in the blood of Jesus once more and maintain our focus. As a man of God, not just pastor, but a man of God, it's my purpose on this earth to proclaim the name of Jesus and to love other people. You guys have the same calling upon your life. If you find areas of your life that you're not happy with and you've allowed the darkness to slip in and take away your joy, your peace, your love, give it over to God. Go back to the things you did at first. Praying, reading your Bible, asking the Holy Spirit for guidance every time. And see if He doesn't change everything. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, on behalf of this church, Father, we just choose to repent of our ways. Father, I ask you to wash us clean and move us into new realms, Father. Lord, I pray that we can love one another with a pure love. No bitterness, no anger, no quarreling, Father. But we love one another with the agape love that you have given us. Father, we, do not, we are not condoning the actions of the violent or the wicked. And I ask you for justice, Father, to prevail. But Lord, we choose today to trust you to keep our eyes focused upon you and not get dismayed by what we see going on in the world around us. Father, I pray that you send us out as warriors, as ambassadors, Father, as overcomers, Father. Send us out to reach the lost. Thank you, Jesus, for the time that you have set for us to be here. I thank you, Father, for the season. Father, you have orchestrated every part of our lives perfectly father you've done it perfectly lord today i ask you for a fresh anointing to be upon this congregation let us be your hands and feet 
to show Jesus everywhere that we go and be the light of the world. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Hey, I want to thank you for watching with us today. I hope you were blessed and encouraged by this video. I want to invite you to worship with us next Sunday. To make it easier to find us and stay up to date with all of the other videos, I want you to hit the subscribe button at the bottom of this page. This way you never miss another thing. If you want to reach out to me, you can go to our website and scroll all the way to the bottom of the homepage. That website is www.vccphillips.com. You'll see a space to send me a message at the bottom of that page. Thanks again for watching and remember, God loves you. See you next Sunday.